Hi, y'all. We'll get started in just a second. Um, sorry, we just had a few technical difficulties. We'll be right with you. Okay, so I think that we're just going to get started. So thank you so much for coming to Sex After Dark tonight as a part of Sex Week. Um, it's been a really fun week so far, and we still have quite a few events left. But today we are so lucky to have um, Hope Codeman from Dynamo Sex Toys with us to answer all of our um, sex ed questions. Anything and anything that you've ever wanted to know about sex feel free to drop it in the Q&A. So for the Q&A feature, just to give you all a little, um, a little um, instructions, words are hard, uh, but basically you can type in that Q&A feature instead of the chat feature, and you can click the little checkbox if you wanna make it anonymous. You also could make it not anonymous um, up to you, but yeah. So all of your questions can be totally anonymous um, and, yeah, so, and then the other thing is that the first 27 participants um, will get a sex toy, a really high quality, lovely sex toy that we purchased from Dynamo. Um, and so after this event, PD will send um, out an email to those first 27 people and pickups will be next week from Monday to Thursday during office hours. And it'll be first come, first pick. Um, and yeah, so um, Lucian, do you wanna go ahead and introduce Hope? Yeah, sorry. Technical, technical difficulties on my end, but everything is going on right now. So Hope is originally from Western Kentucky, and Hope Codeman came to New Orleans in 20, or 2009 with a passion for frank, honest talk about sexuality. And so she believes that every person is entitled to pleasure and to accurate information about sex. She is also just a really big nerd for everything to do with sex from medical anatomy to the culture of kink. Hope, with the co-founder Nico, created the sex positive shop Dynamo in 2013. Their goal was to create a safe, welcoming, comfortable space where people could ask questions about sex, find community, and purchase high quality, body safe toys. Starting off as a humble pop-up, Dynamo is now a full-time brick and mortar boutique just a few blocks away from Frenchman Street. So once again, we are super lucky to have you here, Hope, and we're gonna go ahead and get started asking you the first question of tonight. Thank you so much for having me, appreciate it. We're so lucky to have you here, Hope. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask the first question of the night, which is, what are some COVID safe sex tips? Is masked sex COVID safe? And what does hookup culture look like during COVID? Sure, so in terms of safer sex, whether we're talking about um, STIs, whether we're talking about um, you know, physical safety, perhaps in a kinky situation, or when we're talking about um, COVID, we really want to be risk aware. Um, and so some of the, the advice or the thoughts that I have, I want to put them in the context of, you know, what are people actually going to do um, versus what are the, the best case practices? So I think, I mean, to be perfectly honest, uh, we, we are so close, you know, the vaccines are coming. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think we're really going to get there. So continuing to be as safe as possible, 
um, you know, not, <laughs> we, we haven't come this far to risk um, another surge, you know, or, or yourself or loved ones or your community members getting sick. So truly the safest COVID sex practices for folks that are outside of your pod, um, you know, outside of, of the people that you see um, unmasked on the regular would be uh, distanced sex to be honest, um, you know, sexy texts, sexy photos, um, phone sex. Uh, these are all a lot more uh, safe in terms of, of the virus. I think uh, in terms of choosing sex partners um, and, and forging uh, those, those uh, relationships uh, based on trust and communication, you know, if we are going to look for a sex partner, taking the time to make sure that folks are, you know, recently tested, uh, you know, have a negative uh, Corona test and, um, you know, are being as safe as possible, both in terms of uh, safer sex practices and COVID safe practices. Uh, I think a mask would be better than no mask, to be honest, but since the primary form of transmission for COVID does seem to be you know, particles. Uh, when you're having sex, your, your faces are usually close together. Um, so I think just, again, being as risk aware, understanding that we're, we're really close to, I hope, being uh, out of the woods with this, um, that folks will just be as safe as they possibly can and, and maybe wait a little bit longer. But I know that's not necessarily um, realistic or viable for every person. So I think in terms of hookup culture, because by necessity, we're having a lot of conversations in terms of our relationships, our hookups, our encounters that we probably should have been having all along in terms of uh, boundaries, super important, um, expectations, uh, communicating about what we want and need out of these encounters, both things that are on the table and off, uh, using COVID safe practices as a way to have those conversations could be, uh, that's a good opportunity to really keep those going forward. And I would hope, again, I don't know what the situation is at Tulane right now. I'm like 12 years away from college at this point. Um, but I think it could be a great way to open up more conversations, more communication about safety, about consent, and about those good boundaries. So yeah. Moving on to our next question, how do you prepare for sex in a realistic manner compared to how it's usually portrayed in movies slash media? Oh, sure. So movies and, and porn too um, often don't have the time or it doesn't suit the plot or, you know, you've got to go ahead and cut to the chase. They don't show that preparation. They don't show that communication. They often don't even show that, uh, that, uh, positive seduction. Um, if we look at uh, movie situations, a lot of time it's just, you know, a couple is looking at each other flirtily and then it cuts straight to them, you know, rolling around on a bed. Uh, and then of course they both just have an orgasm immediately, you know, just with no, <laughs> no stimulus. Uh, with porn, a lot of times, again, you have uh, very little setup, usually not a lot of communication, goes straight to the sex. Um, and not always with foreplay. I think especially with certain sex acts and penetrative acts that need more foreplay, more stimulation and more warm up, you don't see that uh, in porn, um, but it's actually really important. So I think um, A, communication, consent, um, talking about both what you are interested in and not interested in. And again, when we have these kind of boundary communications, they don't have to be just negative, you know, they can be framed in a sense of, I'm really excited to get with you. I really would love to try this, this, and this, not so interested in this. What about you? Um, I've had my most recent, uh, uh, STI test, you know, at this time, and these were the results. What about you? And framing it in the idea, which is true that you want to have a good experience, both for yourself and for your partner, this should be mutual. Um, and at the end of the day, you're going to have a much better experience overall, uh, because you've had that talk, you've had that communication and it can be awkward. It can be hard. Um, it can be scary, but I also think that practice makes perfect. Um, in terms of sex itself, again, foreplay is so important. Kissing, making out, um, lube is an unsung hero of sex, in my opinion, for so many things. It makes it more comfortable. Um, it can make it a lot safer. Um, and also just using barriers, you know, like condoms, uh, usually does not get shown in film. So they cut out a lot of the stuff that maybe people think are boring, but actually can be just as titillating, just as exciting, because it's all working to make 
in an experience that's going to be better for everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so next question is, how would you recommend that people who are new to masturbation start out? Sure. I think um, definitely setting a space and a time that is comfortable and secure, which I know can be difficult if you live in a dorm situation or if you live at home. You want to have a space where you know that roommate's not going to come in, parent's not going to come in, um, so that you really can take that time with yourself to explore touch. Um, I would urge folks who are new to it to uh, create a, a really sensual environment, whatever that means to them. Maybe play some music that you find sexy or calming or exciting. Um, maybe you light some kind of like nice candle or have some sort of you know fragrance uh, happening in the room. Um, you're hydrated, you're feeling good and really allowing um, yourself to move you know, hands or toys uh, on different parts of the bodies. So you don't necessarily have to seduce or you don't necessarily have to go straight for the genitals. You can really seduce yourself. Um, and masturbation is such a great way to learn about what you like. Everyone has different favorite places they like to be touched. Everyone has different fantasies that they like to go to. Uh, and your brain is your biggest sexual organ. So when we talk about masturbation, um, using fantasy, you know, or, or porn or erotica or art or whatever it is that uh, you think might be sexy, you know, feel free to explore those things because that can really help to set you in that mood, help to get the blood flowing um, and, and learn a bit about yourself. Final piece of advice I would give is that if you've never masturbated before and if you've never had an orgasm before, not to set the goal to be, I will have an orgasm, you know, this time. Uh, because when we become so focused on a goal, especially that of orgasm, it can make it harder and more stressful to reach. So I think the, the goal should be pleasure and um, discovery. If an orgasm happens, great, but that doesn't have to be a set goal that you stress about. Yeah. So uh, where do you find more information about sex ed specifically from a queer perspective and how do you ex start exploring with a partner? Sure. Um, I think it's definitely a, a, better, a better world and could always be better. Um, the, the journey is not done, the work is not done. But certainly there are a lot more resources uh, for queer folks available now with the internet and with um, queer voices becoming more, um, more amplified and I hope they become more so. Um, in terms of just off the top of my head and I can certainly uh, like dig back for some more resources as well. Um, there's a website that it's called Scarletine, um, but I think is good for people of all, you know, sexually active ages. Um, the website's been around for a long time. It tends very inclusive. There are resources for queer folks and it's just this massive sex ed website. Um, I also really like um, the webcomic Oh Joy Sex Toy. I'm a huge sucker for graphic novels and comics. And uh, the illustrator, uh, Erica Moen, is a queer woman who, you know, makes it with her partner. Um, sometimes they review toys, but a lot of what they do is talking about different aspects of sex. Um, and all of the, the people uh, that she shows, you know, to, to give examples um, are, you know, just really cheerfully, lovingly drawn, tons of different bodies and genders and races and abilities. Uh, she has a few books that are just generally about sex. Um, one is Sex Ed, The Basics, and one is for slightly younger folks, more for teens called Let's Talk About It. Um, both of those are really, really good. Um, and I think also utilizing your community um, in terms of, uh, you know, queer and LGBT groups on campus, um, getting involved with them um, can also be a really great way to learn and also find community. Great. So um, from the perspective of someone who has a vagina and only has sex with people who also have vaginas, do you still need to worry about STIs and how can you have safer sex? Sure. So STIs are something that really everyone should be, um, you know, have in their mind. Um, not in a way that has to be deadly, scary, stressful. Knowledge is power. Um, so when two folks with vaginas are having sex, um, there is still risk for some STIs. Um, and so I think definitely getting tested um, and using barrier methods uh, where appropriate 
is, is still important. It's still part of the responsibility to yourself and to your partner. Um, I'm not sure about testing services on campus. I know that both um, Plant Parenthood and Crescent Care uh, do STI panels. So knowing your status is just really also um, important. Uh, and uh, again, knowledge is power. So there are barriers uh, that you can use. For example, uh, dental dams can be used, which are often latex, although you can sometimes use saran or even um, use a nitrile glove, uh, cut down the side with the fingers off, uh, can be great for giving oral, uh, especially if one partner uh, has or might be at risk for STIs, or if you just wanna be extra safe. Um, using lube with dental dams is a great way to make it just more slippery and sexy for everybody. Um, I personally love the method of using a black nitrile glove, like, um, tattoo artists use. A, because like black nitrile is just sexy, in my opinion. Uh, you cut the fingers off and cut it down the side, you spread it out, and you have this really nice, uh, good coverage dam. If you leave the thumb there, you even have a place to put your tongue. Um, you can also, if uh, you're two folks who are playing with toys, uh, for example, dildos or any kind of phallic toys, um, you can still cover those toys with a condom um, as a way to just keep the toy cleaner if you might be sharing it between partners or uh, didn't have a chance to clean it between uses. But yeah, I mean, safer sex and, and STIs are something that everybody's responsible for. The American Pie franchise tried to describe having sex with a woman like having sex with a warm cherry pie. Is this accurate? And what food would you compare sex to? Oh my goodness, this is such a funny question. Ah, you know, I think, so I, I do not have a penis. So I believe when they were um, describing uh, having sex with the pie or having sex with uh, a person with a vagina as having sex with uh, a warm pie, I couldn't say, I wouldn't know from experience. Um, I think that it could certainly be delicious. Um, as far as what food I think it feels like, I think it's, it's, it's the buffet of the mind, you know, and every person's a different flavor. So every experience is a different flavor, uh, but be careful having sex with pies because if they're really hot, you might get burned. That's all I got on that one though. Sorry, um, no, you're do, you have any, <laughs> do you have any tips for navigating sexual encounters with a newly decreased sex drive and trouble reaching orgasm due to medication? Sure. So that is a very real uh, thing that can happen. Uh, different medications can absolutely affect your sex drive. Uh, and that's something that's important to just acknowledge. Uh, sometimes people are taken aback when themselves or their partners are, you know, either don't have as high of a sex drive or um, have a harder time orgasming uh, when they're taking certain medications. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they should stop, stop taking those medications, but it is more to navigate. Um, I think being gentle with yourself, I think um, if orgasm is a factor, possibly experimenting with other masturbation or sex techniques uh, than what worked before, you may need stronger stimulation. You might want to bring toys or different positions into the bedroom. And also, I think it's valuable to think of um, what we think of as a sex drive as uh, another way to think of that would be um, a series of gas and brakes. You know, what turns us on, what gets us going versus what maybe turns us off or slows us down. Uh, there's a really good book called Come As You Are by Emily Nagoski um, that primarily is focused on the, the sexual drive of uh, cis women, but I think could really be accurate for a lot of folks and, a, you know, across a lot of genders. Um, finding what really helps to get you there, uh, given uh, the chemistry that your body has at that time, doing that experimentation, again, not worrying too much about goals, because again, the goal of orgasm can stress you out. Uh, so focusing just on the pleasure you're having at the moment. And then if you're game for sex, if you're, if you're into it, you can scent, you're just not feeling like spontaneously horny. Um, some folks find that once they get started kissing, massaging, or making out that they get horny. So obviously this is something that needs to be communicated and, and consistent communication with the partner. But if you want to have sex, you just don't like already feel aroused. Um, 
sometimes starting a make out, you know, starting touch and, and checking in from there, you may find that you're more down than you thought you were. How can you talk about communication with casual partners versus long-term partners? Sure. I think communication is, bleh, communication is just as important for casual partners as with long-term. I think that even if it's a hookup, even if it's someone that you um, are not, uh, maybe you don't know as well, um, I think we can still be kind to each other. I think we can still treat each other with respect. So seeing that other person as a person um, and uh, expecting them to see you as a person as well. Um, I don't think that every sexual encounter has to be love. I don't think that every sexual encounter has to be, um, you know, aiming to, to get uh, a partner or keep a partner. Um, but I think just in terms of talking about, um, again, uh, boundaries, likes, dislikes, um, triggers, um, and safer sex, I think you owe it to yourself and to the other person to still have those conversations. And again, it can be framed very positively. You're really hot. I'm really, you know, interested in you. Uh, if this is going where I think it might be going, uh, would you like to talk about this a little bit more? Because that will make this, uh, better for the both of us and go from there. I think when people are already interested in having sex, uh, talking about it, even when we have these, you know, important conversations that you should have, uh, can still be sexy, can still be flirty. And then you learn more about the other person. So do you have any advice for anal from the perspective of someone who totally wants to, and their partner also wants to, um, but they're just nervous? Sure. Uh, so anal sex, uh, can be super fun for folks with all different bodies, you know, whatever, uh, whatever bits you've got, um, anal can be pleasurable, uh, but it is uh, a little bit trickier. Um, it's something that requires a little more prep, um, a little more understanding, a little more patience. Uh, but I think the rewards can be great. So reasons to have anal sex, A, um, the anal opening is packed with nerve endings. It's very innervated. Um, and our entire pelvic region, whether, uh, you know, penis, balls, uh, clitoris, vulva, and anus, all of these nerves can fire together when we're aroused. Um, and at the end of the day, orgasm happens in our brain. So stimulating and, and seducing and touching this part of the body uh, can feel super great you know, for everyone involved. Uh, if the person who is receiving has a prostate, that also, um, it's just a whole nother dimension. Some people call it, uh, you know, the G spot for folks with a penis. So there are many reasons to try it, um, but you definitely need to go in informed. So a little bit of an anatomy lesson. Let's see. Okay. We'll, we'll show on this diagram. So this uh, is a person with a penis and with a prostate. Um, but you can see the anal opening here uh, leading to the rectum. There's actually two sphincters right here at the anal opening. So one that you can control uh, when you are either holding or releasing uh, to go to the bathroom and one that you can't. That's the one on the inside. Um, the one that you can't is tied to your just automatic nervous system, your breathing, your heartbeat. Um, and so you cannot trick the sphincter. You cannot fool your butt. Uh, if you are nervous, if you are not turned on, if you are not relaxed, um, that inner sphincter is unlikely to relax enough to make penetration comfortable. So going in informed and trusting your partner and trusting yourself and, and going in with the understanding that you can go slow. And if something hurts, you can stop. These are all ways to really know that that penetration can be comfortable um, and can be safe. So I would start honestly by yourself before you bring a partner into it. Um, again, a comfortable space could be the shower even, um, you know, just with a finger, you know, stimulating the outside, possibly inserting a finger if that feels okay, just to get used to how anal penetration can feel. Lube is your friend always. Um, so the vagina is a self-lubricating uh, organ. The butt is not. Uh, and the, the butt also absorbs a lot of water. So you need a lot of lube um, both in prep and during anal sex to make it comfortable um, and to protect those delicate tissues. Um, you could also experiment with butt plugs or small toys on your own or with a partner. Um, anything that goes into your butt should have a flared base. So this 
feel like I'm doing makeup on YouTube. This is a butt plug. Um, and as you can see, it's got a tapered tip. So this is gonna make it easier to insert. It has a slender neck and then it has a flared base. So this essentially works as a stopper. Um, your butt does not really have an endpoint other than your mouth, I suppose. So things can get lost in the booty. Um, the vagina ends with the cervix. You're not going to permanently lose something uh, in a vagina, but um, the butt does not have <laughs> such an endpoint. And when a person is aroused, um, those, those sphincters can actually pull up. So it's, it's easier than you think to lose something um, in an anus. That's why we see all of those um, x-rays of, you know, uh, Sharpies and uh, Buzz Lightyear figurines and uh, uh, syrup bottles and everything else that people have um, accidentally lost in their butts. We don't want that for you. So anything that goes in the butt should have a flared base. And then in terms of when you feel comfortable with, um, you know, objects that are, if your partner has a penis, um, the size of that penis or that toy or whatever they want to use to penetrate you with, um, again, uh, take the time, go slow. It may have taken weeks or longer to work up to that comfort. Uh, and then with your partner, again, communication is key. Going slow. Uh, talking to each other, focusing on pleasure. And if something hurts, stop. You can always try again another time. Um, and I do not recommend any kind of numbing cream or any kind of numbing agent, um, just because again, our butts are resilient, but the tissue is fragile. Fissures, hemorrhoids, none of this is fun. This is painful. And if something hurts, that's your body telling you that you need to slow down or stop for the night. So you don't want to be numb, not realize you've had an injury and then find out the next day. So it's better to feel those sensations, um, A, because that way you can feel the good sensations um, and you can know that you're being safe. Yeah. There's a lot we can do. We do a whole workshop on, workshop on butts, but this is everything that came to mind just now. Uh, sorry. Do you have any tips for fisting? How can someone go about this in a safe way? Ooh. So actually one of our educators, Lizanne, uh, is, is more of, uh, the person to ask about fisting. Um, she's, uh, very knowledgeable. Um, and we probably will have a fisting class at some point, but I think again, um, fisting is, more on the side of Olympic level activity. Um, it is amazing what bodies can do and what our bodies can hold, but, uh, going slow is, is very important. Um, lots of, um, foreplay, lots of external stimulation, um, lots of lube, uh, using a gloved hand. Again, I really like the nitrile gloves because sometimes partners have latex allergies. Um, anytime you're using gloves uh, for sex, and this is also true for, for folks of, of any uh, gender, any, any gender partnership. When we talked about two folks with vaginas, um, gloves also super sexy and super valid. Um, they protect our hands uh, in case you have any kind of small cuts, you know, protects you from any kind of um, um, bacteria or anything getting into your skin, and then also protects your partner um, from anything you might have on your hands. Um, and if you have, for example, nails, or if you, you know, don't have super moisturized hands, um, it can make it more comfortable for them. If you are someone who has long nails, um, trim those, or you can actually put um, little bits of cotton ball in the fingertips of a glove and then put your hand in so that it basically mutes those, those long talon nails. Um, but just keep those kinds of things in mind. Uh, and then again, in terms of fisting, you're not going in like this, <laughs> you're going in like this, right? So you're creating that taper, just like we talked about, uh, with the, uh, with the plug, um, so that you have that, that ease of entry. Um, but yeah, that's off the top of my head, uh, the, the tips that I would give for sure, but it takes a lot of time. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no, you're fine. Can you possibly give a brief one-on-one -on, -one on sex toys? What to consider? What are some more basic toys you could start with? And could you potentially discuss some of the different types of vibrators that you sell at Dynamo? Yeah, sure. So uh, sex toys are many and varied. Uh, sex toys vary um, anywhere from, uh, you know, a vibrator to a dildo 
big difference being vibrators vibrate, dildos are stationary, uh, phalluses. Um, let's see, cock rings uh, that are worn on penises. Um, there are toys that create suction around clitorises or nipples. Um, there are strokers. This is actually a stroker that was designed uh, for trans men. Um, so if you've heard of like a fleshlight um, that, that some folks with penises might use for masturbation, this is essentially um, a trans male, a trans masculine version of a fleshlight. Um, lube, I would consider to be uh, a sex product, if not a sex toy, um, and certainly uh, booty safe items as well. Uh, when we're looking to pick out a sex toy, a couple of things in mind. Um, one is that sex toys are not inherently gendered. Um, I think a lot of folks come in and say, well, I want, you know, a woman's sex toy or where's your stuff for men? The fact is you can use toys in so many ways so creatively. Vibrators can be used on so many different parts of the body. Um, cock rings can be used on dildos, uh, you know, you can use vibrators on the nipples. You can use them uh, behind the ear. Um, you can use them on the outside of a penis. There's, there's many ways to use these items. And I think it's really fun to get creative. Other thing to keep in mind is you wanna make sure that the materials that are used to construct your toy are high quality and body safe. Um, so believe it or not, there is no regulating body on what can go into sex toys. Um, a lot of them are marketed and sold as novelties uh, because they don't want to undergo the regulation to sell them as any kind of health device. Um, it's gotten better as people have become more informed about what they should expect from sex toys, uh, but there's still some not so great ingredients that can be found, especially in um, the stereotypical jelly or real skin sex toys that you might see, the really kind of squishy floppy ones um, that you might've seen in movies or in certain sex shops. Uh, these can contain chemicals that can cause allergic reactions. Um, they can melt. They can um, basically pass on chemicals into sensitive mu mucous membranes. One of the big chemicals to get super nerdy with it uh, is a group of uh, plastic softeners called phthalates uh, that were long used in dildos and vibrators to make them squishy. Um, but these are now known to be uh, potential hormone disruptors, possibly even um, linked with like cancer, not something that you want to have uh, in your, your sensitive bits. So at Dynamo, one of our main missions was to sell sex toys and only carry sex toys that were made of body safe, high quality materials, and basically take that work out of the way for you so that you could come in confidently knowing that what we sold um, was safe and high quality. So the, the materials that we use to create the toys, or we don't build them, that would be cool one day. <laughs> the toys that we uh, stock, are made of body safe materials, which means they're stable. Um, they're not going to break down. They're not going to loose chemicals into the body. So good examples of these body safe materials would be um, medical or food grade silicone, uh, stainless steel. This is a toy called the Pure Wand. It's a really legendary G-spot and or prostate toy. Um, glass is a good uh, safe uh, material, um, Pyrex style glass, shatterproof borosilicate glass. Um, ABS plastic is okay, so a non-porous hard plastic. Um, and then some folks will also use certain treated woods um, if you know the material and you know the seal. Uh, you also wanna look for non-porous toys anytime it's an object that you're going to be inserting into the body. Non-porous means that it doesn't have microscopic holes that can hold bacteria um, that would prevent them from being completely sterilized. So again, a lot of those squishier toys um, are porous, which means they can hold bacteria. They shouldn't be shared. Um, and I wouldn't really uh, insert them into the body. Now, some toys like again, strokers are made of a squishy elastomer that is porous. But again, since it's on the outside of a body part, not being used to penetrate, um, it's not as risky in that case. Um, in terms of finding a toy, picking one out, um, I do think that when you can come to a sex shop, whether mine or someone else's, um, if you do it in person, you get a better sense of what you're actually getting. Um, uh, any sex toy shop worth its salt, in my opinion, uh, lets customers pick things up, turn things on, actually hold it in their hand to see how big is it, how does it feel, um, what speeds does it have, if it has a motor. Um, 
because you're not going to be able to take it back. Uh, there's really no ethical way to sell uh, used sex toys in that way. I suppose like a single person could, uh, you know, if it's, it's not something we do. Um, if you want to sterilize and recycle sex toys amongst your friends, that is certainly uh, up to you, but it's not something we do at the shop. We don't take returns. So we want to make sure people get uh, the best toy they can possibly have for them. Um, you don't have to spend a ton of money. Uh, our most popular toy is just a small vibrator. Um, this is the full size BAM, but there's one that's a little smaller called the BAM Mini. Um, that is our best selling um, first time vibrator. It's $25, rechargeable, uh, splash proof, and it's got a range of speeds from light to medium. Um, if you're not sure what kind of speeds you want, get something with a range so that it's not, oh, this is not strong enough, or this is way too strong. It's going to you know, uh, uh, be annoying to me to use it. Uh, so giving yourself some variation and maybe starting with something that's not as expensive. There are also some really great sex toy reviewers online. Um, two of my favorites are Hey Epiphora. Um, she talks about sex toys from really inclusive queer perspective and also just brutally honest. Um, I'll actually write her blog name in the chat. Hey Epiphora. And then um, I also like the Falophile reviews. Um, but those are two really fantastic sex toy reviewers that I've actually even used to help me pick what we're gonna carry in the store. That was a lot. If there's anything I didn't answer from that, just let me know and I'm happy to, to keep going. How do you clean sex toys? Yeah, okay. So when you would go to sex shops, um, and they still do this in some places, they will tell you that you have to buy their toy cleaner, right? To properly clean your sex toy. That is an upsell. Um, you do need to clean your sex toys. Uh, you should do it before and after each use. Uh, again, to remove any kind of lint or any kind of bacteria or fluids. Um, certainly if you're gonna be sharing sex toys with other people, make sure they are cleaned, you know, sterilized between each use. But you don't necessarily have to buy some kind of expensive spray to do that. Gentle soap and water will do the trick. Um, and I would say use the same soap that you would use on your own genitals, your own sensitive bits. Uh, so it doesn't need to be necessarily dish soap, you know, or anything that's super uh, caustic or um, harsh. Uh, soap is soap. So use a gentle soap and water. If it's something that is not waterproof, you know, you can use like a wet washcloth to help with this so that it doesn't touch any of the electronics. A lot of toys these days are waterproof or splash proof. Um, so, I mean, soap and water really does do the trick if your toy is non-porous. Um, for certain toys that are just solid silicone, for example, you can boil them. Um, you can literally get like a pot that you designate as your like sex toy cleaning pot boiling water, you know, maybe 10 minutes, obviously be careful, don't burn yourself. Um, and that will sterilize it too. Uh, some people really like to use boiling for booty toys just to help to eradicate any scent uh, that might linger and to feel like those toys are really, really clean. Um, the top rack of the dishwasher on sterilized mode, no detergent or anything, just top rack sterilized mode can also work for some toys. You just don't want to do this with anything that is, uh, has a motor to it. Uh, but silicone, because this is the same kind of silicone that you might use in the kitchen, um, this will stand up to heat just fine. Uh, and then if you have a toy that you're not sure about, um, or it is porous, um, you can always put a condom on it also, uh, whether to use it with somebody other than yourself, uh, or just to protect yourself if you're not sure if the material is body safe. Yeah. How can you experiment with erogenous zones? Sure. A hack that I got from a really amazing sex educator called Ducky Doolittle, look her up. She's been in the business for like 25 years, She's really excellent. Um, something that she would always teach was any part of the body that does not get touched often can be an erogenous zone. Um, so obviously our genitals can be erogenous, A, because they are where for many folks, um, you know, orgasms are felt, the act of sex might be uh, centered around them, and they aren't necessarily touched super often. But think about those parts of the body that uh, people don't touch you and don't necessarily touch surfaces. So I would challenge you to think of these parts of the body on yourself and on your partner, um, if they are willing, 
uh, when you explore touch. Um, places like, you know, the back of the neck, behind the ears, um, the inner arm, the inner thigh, uh, you know, the stomach. Um, for folks with penises, one of the most sensitive parts a is the, the frenulum, which is sort of the, where the, the corona or the head of the penis comes to a point, but actually the entire underside of the penis uh, tends to be more sensitive because when a person is not erect, uh, the top of the penis touches their pants, touches their clothing, touches their underwear, but the bottom just touches worm skin. So think of those areas that maybe don't get a lot of friction in the day to day because those senses can often be heightened. That's, that's my tip there. What ways can you and your partner explore the psychological aspects of sex and foreplay rather than just the physical? Sure, I think the art of the tease and the buildup and again, the mental aspects of sex, I think can be underrated, especially when you're young. And I think those can be just as fun, as uh, delightful, as exciting as um, physical culminations. So I think talking about uh, sexual matters in non, well, with consent of everyone involved. And, you know, if you're in uh, company with other folks, obviously make sure that they're okay with that. Um, talking about aspects of sexuality with each other in situations where you aren't about to have sex um, can help you to have a better understanding of that person's likes and desires and where they're coming from and where they might be going. Um, reading erotica together, watching porn or watching sexy movies together. Uh, Tumblr used to be really good for all kinds of sexy things, but it, it got uh, a lot more censored in the past few years. Um, but but uh, indulging in that kind of media together um, can be a great way to open up those conversations or just learn new things about each other, what you might like. Um, the car, <laughs> drive safely, uh, but the car can be a good place to have these conversations because you don't necessarily have to look at each other if you're nervous. You know, you can look out the window, you can look at the road if you're driving. Um, and you can have these, the, the car can be a good place for any kind of conversation where you're scared to look the other person in the eye, but you need to have that conversation face to face. Um, also, especially right now when we're more distanced, um, sexting and, and phone sex and, you know, chat can be a great way because you really have to paint a picture with your mind um, and with your words and with your imagination um, to explore those fantasies or those likes and dislikes. But I feel like a, a broken record, but I'm a big fan of using your words. And again, practice makes perfect. So on a related note, do you have recommendations for ethical porn websites? Ooh, okay. So I think one of the easiest ways to find porn that is more ethical is you pay for your porn. Um, when we look at sites like, uh, you know, uh, Pornhub or, um, you know, RedTube or anything like that, that's kind of an aggregate. It's tough because it's free. Free is great. But some of those uploads are not done with the consent of the performers. Um, you don't necessarily know who those performers are, whether they knew that they were being filmed, whether they knew, uh, whether they got any money or compensation from that uh, video. Um, and so, we wanna make sure that the folks who are participating both consented to the, the porn itself and the sex itself, uh, but also it being on that platform. We wanna make sure that they got paid, they got compensated, they're okay. Um, so few different avenues. Um, there is a great uh, queer porn series, it's been out for a few years called The Crash Pad. Uh, that is just a really cool, uh, sexy, gender diverse uh, series of porn films. Um, there was a, let's see, sorry, I'm going to pull up a window real quick. Um, there's an educator, now an educator that used to direct porn called Tristan Tiramino, who made uh, really fantastic porn, some of which was educational. Um, there is a Canadian site called Cherry Stems that actually a friend of mine runs. Um, and she's very uh, involved in making sure that um, the, the 
performers are compensated and that everything's above board. Um, Erica Lust makes some really nice, um, beautifully shot uh, porn um, that often um, women and femmes tend to really enjoy. But I think uh, a shortcut really is uh, if you want ethical porn, pay the performers directly, make sure that they're being compensated because it's hard to know uh, when it's those free aggregates. Uh, another Sex Week panel had brought up the yes, no, maybe list. Are yeah. there any other resources similar to this that you'd recommend? Sure. So for those who may not have heard before, yes, no, maybe lists are lists uh, with um, basically a listing of different, we'll say sex acts, anything from kissing to blowjobs to spanking. Um, and that it'll have a, a chart that says yes, no, or maybe to each one, kind of like a BuzzFeed quiz. Uh, and a person would fill it out saying, okay, you know, kissing, yes, anal, uh, giving, yes, receiving, maybe. Uh, and you just go through and you consider um, what your thoughts are on each act that you might participate in. Your partner can do the same thing and you can compare notes. If you're a little shy to bring up some of these activities or you don't want to show, basically if you're shy, uh, there is a website called the Mojo Upgrade that does it for you. Um, the Mojo Upgrade is an online version of it where uh, it emails you and your partner. You both fill out the list separately, and then it emails the response of what you both agreed on. So if they were really into one thing and you were like, hell no, it's not going to show that as an option. Um, but if you're both maybe or if you're both yes, um, you can see where you coincide. So it uh, can be good for shy people if you want to try it that way. But the Mojo Upgrade. Do you have any suggestions on how to spice up a couple's sex life and how this can be done in a safe and healthy way? Sure. Honestly, uh, I was going to say uh, for that question also, yes, no, maybe less um, could be a really great way to get the conversation started. Um, and again, kind of like what we talked about with that mental aspect, um, you know, uh, watching a sexy film together, you know, reading an article or a short story, um, absorbing art or going to an event, whether it's a, a burlesque show or a play uh, or a, a performance art piece that is uh, sexy in nature and talking about it together. Um, also just breaking up the routine. I think sometimes couples fall into, you know, we have sex at this time of day or in the bedroom, on the bed, or, um, you know, this day of the week. And I think changing those up can help to um, basically just shake up the expectations, get out of any kind of rut that you may feel that you're in. Um, there are some good books and workbooks that you can go through together as well. Um, again, for uh, cis women, femmes, I would argue other genders as well, but again, she just hasn't got to that yet. So I don't want to, to blanket statement. Um, Come As You Are is just a great book to read about uh, arousal and different expectations of arousal. And it has workbook pages at the end. Um, and we also have like sex games at the shop that you can find both at Dynamo and, and online and at other shops um, that have, you know, a hundred questions about sex that you can ask each other. Could be a good road trip game or a good vacation game. Um, you know, sexy dares. Um, uh, there's a fantasy deck that we have where you can pull different role play scenarios to try out. Um, all of these, basically making it, making it fun, doing uh, sex labs together, different experiments to uh, try out things you may not have tried before. And you can look at it as a scientific pursuit uh, that has uh, very fun results. Those are many and varied ideas, spitballing. How does one bring up kink or fantasies with their partner? Sure, again, um, I think if there is a specific kink that you are interested in and you, I mean, you can also just straight up break it, bring it up to them, you know, when you're having a conversation and uh, perhaps it turns a little sexy, say, you know, um, have you ever been interested in exploring this? I think that could be really sexy. Uh, sometimes if you just say, what do you think about bondage? Um, if the person uh, isn't expecting it, 
they may think that you're not into it. And so they'd be like, oh, that's weird. What actually they might be game. Um, so being upfront with the idea that I actually think this could be really sexy. I'd like to learn more about it. What about you? Um, framing things in that positive way. Uh, again, with the expectation that like, hey, you might get some fun action out of this. Uh, probably would yield better results. Um, another trick, and this may sound silly, uh, if you're really shy to bring something up, I am uh, totally not above saying to a partner, you know, I had this dream about you that was so sexy. And in the dream, I gave you a spanking, you know, that's so hot to me. Can, can we try that? Uh, because then it's like, I didn't come up with this. It was my dream. Um, so there's a few different ways you can go about it. Um, again, yes, no, maybe lists are great. Uh, if there's a particular film, say, uh, the secretary is a really good one in terms of kink and power dynamic, uh, dynamics, both, uh, leads are imperfect beings that learn and grow. I think it's a better example than 50 shades of gray, all things considered, uh, not perfect, but, but better. Um, or, uh, just, you know, pieces of media that might represent aspects of kink that you're into. Um, I think that it's not a good idea to spring it on them just in the heat of the moment, um, because people may feel taken aback or they may not feel like they can say no. Um, but there are different ways to bring it up. And I think as kink becomes, um, more normalized and more just, uh, seen as another aspect that is available on the sexual buffet, uh, I think these conversations are becoming a little bit easier, but even, you know, Netflix shows or movies that might have aspects of kink into them um, can be good ways to, to bring it up. And we have classes at Dynamo when it's not a pandemic uh, that are about, you know, uh, kink techniques, uh, how to do these things safely, how to have these conversations to set up scenes uh, for different kinky activities. Um, so stay tuned for those as well. How do you give good oral sex to a partner? Sure. Um, so again, depending on, I guess, the setting, um, the, the genitals that your partner has, one thing to keep in mind uh, when pleasuring a partner, regardless of um, their gender or, or uh, what genitals they have, is to keep in mind that when we are forming as fetuses, um, every person, regardless of sex and gender, starts with the same bits, starts with the same tissues. So, and again, there's, there's a wide variation of how genitals might look. Um, you know, we have penises, we have vaginas. There's also uh, one to 2% of the world's population um, that is intersex, you know, that might have um, different configurations um, that, that, you know, combine some of those two. There are as many people who are intersex as who are redhead on this planet. So that is not uncommon in any way. But when we're in the womb, we all start with the same basic bits. So the clitoris has a corollary in the head of a penis, right? There are actually two uh, legs to the clitoris that are hidden underneath the labia. They're called the crura. So you don't see them from the outside, but they are there under the labia, um, which correlate with the shaft of the penis. So believe it or not, the clitoris also gets an erection, excuse me, also gets an erection with arousal um, because it will, it'll swell with blood. The crura and the, the um, head of the clitoris will uh, get a little bit bigger and more pronounced. Um, there is the G-spot uh, just inside uh, the vaginal opening towards the belly button, uh, which is correlated with the prostate for folks who have prostates. So keeping this in mind, even if your uh, partner has different genitals than you do, some of the ways that you like to be touched on your erogenous zones, they might enjoy as well. Um, I think definitely starting slow. Again, all of this is, is seduction and buildup and foreplay. So, you know, Again, regardless of the person's um, genitals, you know, kissing around the thighs, kissing around their stomach, um, not necessarily going straight for the most sensitive bits. A can make it more heightened and more comfortable. Um, feeling free to use your hands, um, using uh, sounds, using you know your nose, your chin, your cheeks, um, and also not feeling like you have to look like people do in porn. Again, whether you're giving blowjobs, cunnilingus, anything in between. When you look at people give oral in porn, 
what they're doing is making the best shot for the camera and what those producers think that the audience wants to see. So for example, if someone is uh, giving oral sex to someone with a vagina in porn, they're often kind of like distanced <laughs> from the, their partner's vagina. Um, and, you know, they're not necessarily providing a lot of, you know, pressure um, because you're trying to get the camera in between the face uh, and, and the person's vagina. So um, more contact is, is better for a lot of people. Same with um, someone who's giving a blowjob in porn might feel pressured to deep throat, uh, might feel pressured to make, you know, specific expressions or, um, you know, spit, <laughs> whatever the case may be. That can be fine if you're into it and your partner's into it, but there's no, you know, one way that you have to do it perfectly to, to be just like, just like a porn star. Um, using your hands both on penises and vaginas is A, super hot and useful and B, can help save your jaw, uh, and save your gag reflex. Um, if you are being penetrated, uh, in the mouth, you don't have to take the entire shaft. You can use your hands. Uh, this part of the penis is the most, um, sensitive in the first place. So using hands, using spit, using lube, um, and taking time to listen for verbal and nonverbal feedback too. You know, you can dive in, but you also want to make sure that it's that back and forth with your partner knowing, okay, they seem to really like this. Um, they're, they're kind of mm, seeming distracted now. Let's have a check-in. And using your words too can also be super hot. You know, uh, do you like this? What if I did this to you? How does this feel? That can be good for all forms of sex, including oral. Again, very broad question with many answers. How do you navigate Tinder safely and like meeting someone online and dating in online spaces, especially with COVID? Sure. Again, um, I think with Tinder, um, and again, I will be perfectly honest in that I am a few years outside uh, using uh, Tinder, Grindr, any of those. Um, that was not my generation, so I don't want to be uh, flip in any way. Um, and y'all may even know more than I do, but I think having communication first, um, meeting someone without the expectation of sex and in a public place for any kind of online dating is super important. Um, just because you, you don't want to necessarily go straight from, you know, your phone or your computer to someone's house, um, just for safety. And this is true for all genders, all sexualities. Um, we want to, uh, take care of ourselves, um, meeting in a public place, you know, having a friend that you can call, you know, to say, okay, I'm safe or, Hey, get me out of here. Um, all very important. And that's, that's true for Tinder in and out of COVID. As far as COVID goes again, um, it's tough because, you know, if you're going to meet someone in person, you know, when was your last negative test? Let's meet outside. Let's go for a walk. Let's wear our masks. Um, just because again, we're so close. <laughs> we're so close to, uh, I think being through with this and there's still a risk, you know, in terms of transmission. And I know for younger folks and even folks, my age, I'm 35, the risk is definitely lower, but even if you're not getting yourself really, really sick, we want to be good stewards of our community. You know, we, we live in this amazing city with people of, of all ages and backgrounds. And if not for ourselves, then our community, I think it's important to stop that spread, to slow that spread. And if that means having a more extended um, dating or conversation with someone on an app like Tinder uh, or Grindr before meeting in person, before um, having any kind of physical intimacy, um, to me, I say so be it, uh, but that's just me. And I think we have to navigate these things for ourselves. But um, thinking of the safety of ourselves and of others, I think is something that we should just really consider. As a woman who has always identified as queer, who has only ever known themselves as queer and has never experienced attraction to men until very recently, how would one go about exploring this possibly newfound attraction to men? How do you navigate this fear of experimenting with your sexuality? Ooh, that's a great question. I think, I, I think honestly, that's something that would best be served um, being gentle with yourself, being open to new experiences and not necessarily um, 
being married to any one outcome. And I think that's true when we explore um, different, uh, you know, sexualities or, or genders that we didn't know that we had attraction for or that we, you know, want to, to learn more about. Maybe we've been attracted to this, uh, this uh, gender of person, but um, have never dated or, or been with um, a person of that gender before, whether it's kink, whether it's um, a new relationship scenario. Um, I think as far as an attraction to men goes, um, I think that men are, men are folks and we want to hold them to high standards and we want to have good relationships with anyone that we might date. Um, and I think bringing some of the sensibilities that can be found into a, found in a queer relationship, um, you know, often, but not always, I, I think queer folks have the advantage of, you know, more communication perhaps baked in um, or, or different modalities of sexuality that folks who are living under kind of the hetero pressure don't want or get to explore as automatically. And again, different for every community. Um, but I think heterosex needs to be queered. <laughs> Maybe that's a hot take, but in terms of, uh, high expectations, communication, bucking gender roles, um, you know, putting consent to the forefront. I think all of these things can be done uh, in a, for example, you know, cis man, cis woman relationship. And I think if our culture is to uh, progress and, and um, maybe heal and, and uh, move forward, having these conversations and these experiences available to all people is a great way to do that. That's a big, broad way to answer that question. Um, but I think, yeah, that it might be uh, worth it to just explore what aspects of men are exciting and, and people that you find that fit that, um, that turn you on, that, that you might want to explore dating um, and talk to them. But I know that can be hard. I know that can be scary. Do you have any advice on unlearning ideas of prudeness and virginity or destigmatizing sexuality within yourself? Sure. A lot of us were raised, and I, I was raised in the South. I was raised in Kentucky. Um, but regardless of what region, a lot of Americans are raised with this um, virginity, purity mindset. I know a lot of my friends had you know, purity rings growing up or made abstinence pledges. Um, unfortunately in our schools, um, abstinence only or abstinence, you know, uh, focused sex education was the norm for a lot of us. Um, schools, you know, could not get funding if they taught, you know, other versions of sex ed. So, you know, a lot of us come by it honestly. Um, and it's something that we're often raised with, whether because of culture, because of religion, because of our parents, um, our friends, whatever the case may be, um, there's, there's a reason for it. That's the culture that a lot of us uh, grew up swimming in. In terms of combating that within ourselves, I think uh, exposure, honestly. Uh, reading uh, work by sex positive authors, following sex positive social media accounts. Um, you know, attending events like this, where you get to learn about uh, other aspects of sex and just a normalized, positive, you know, hopefully, hopefully entertaining way um, can just help us to get over some of those, um, what we might identify as hangups within ourselves, having those conversations, um, getting involved with events that might be sex positive. And it doesn't mean that you have to like jump into bed either. Um, I think one can be sex positive and not be having sex or want to, you know, I think, um, you know, asexual folks that may not feel any desire to have sex can still be sex positive, uh, in terms of a culture and in terms of a community. Um, so yeah, I think consuming media and being around others who have a sex positive, um, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to put this, um, openness, um, or perspective, um, we learn by example, you know, and again, this is not any pressure to say, okay, if you're not, you know, having, uh, the most creative sex, hanging by your ankles, wearing a latex mummy suit while someone plays a harp upside down in the corner, like you don't have to, to, uh, do the wildest thing or jump into, um, uh, you know, the kinkiest act, uh, you do what's good for you. 
and you be gentle with others uh, and, and let others do what's good for them. Really the definition of sex positive is the idea that all sex, as long as it is um, consensual and, and safe, you know, risk aware um, is fine. So I think that is a really great broad way to look at these things. Speaking of consent, how do you make it sexy to ask for consent and find out what your sexual partner is down to do? Sure. Again, I think you can make consent kind of like dirty talk. Um, I think ongoing and, and rolling consent, which I'm sure that um, y'all probably have talked about uh, just in terms of consent conversations on campus can be uh, erotic, you know? Um, if you think that a kiss is about to happen and you're, you're looking each other eye to eye and you're, you know, you say, uh, can I kiss you? Or you say, I would really love it if you kissed me. Um, that's using your words in a pretty sexy way. And it's also getting consent. Um, how does it feel if I touch you here? Um, what, uh, what would you like to do next? What if I took off my shirt? Um, I think these can be really sexy. And also if you're someone who like wants to do dirty talk, but is, uh, nervous about it, um, that's a great way to do it. Obviously, you know, nonverbal communication is just as important if someone's, you know, saying yes, but like, uh, um, you know, we can't, we've, we've also got to, to um, look at and acknowledge and understand what people are saying with their body language. Um, but I think incorporating uh, consent into seduction is a really good, um, thorough way to do it, personally. Do you have any, oh, sorry. How do I do, uh, do you have any tips or advice for having an orgasm during sex, specifically during vaginal penetration? What's the difference between vaginal and clitoral orgasms? Sure. So really good question. Um, I'm gonna use my puppet again. So uh, in terms of, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna assume that the person who asked this um, has, has a vagina too. Um, the majority of folks with vaginas, I'm going to say between 70 and 80% need direct clitoral stimulation to have an orgasm. It is not the norm for folks who have vaginas to be able to come from just penetration alone. Um, there's a lot of, of historic hang up that we can uh, go into. Um, you know, the clitoris wasn't even really necessarily known or identified up until much later in human history than it should have been. Um, you've also got Sigmund Freud, famous psychoanalyst, uh, who would argue that a, a clitoral orgasm was somehow less mature than a vaginal or internal orgasm. That's crap. That's just crap. I don't know what to tell you about that. Freud was problematic in many ways. An important historic figure, but like he wasn't all that. Um, so in terms of having an orgasm for someone with vagina, making sure that there is uh, lots of foreplay, lots of buildup and attention directly to the clitoris um, is, is gonna make it much more likely. That could be through hands. That could be through grinding. I know a lot of folks who can uh, get very close or have an orgasm just from you know grinding externally. Um, that can be through oral. But that could be through toys, um, incorporating toys into sex. But again, that that Clitoral stimulation uh, is necessary for most. And I would actually argue uh, if someone is having a, a vaginal orgasm or a penetrative orgasm, the clitoris is probably still involved uh, in some way or another, because remember, you got the external clitoris and you have the internal clitoris. So there's the crura, the two legs that are under the labia, and there's actually clitoral bulbs behind it. Uh, so if you're, for example, having a G-spot orgasm, the G-spot is about an inch and a half in towards the belly button. So this come hither motion. Um, some people argue that the G-spot is, again, part of the internal clitoris. Uh, if you do want to have a G-spot orgasm, which some people consider to be... Um, really nice and deep, really nice and full. Uh, again, prior arousal helps. Sometimes even already having one orgasm beforehand helps. Um, and again, you want to have either with fingers or with a toy, like a come hither kind of motion. You're almost pulling. Uh, you're applying pressure towards the outside. So a toy like the pure wand, again, this is the pure wand, kind of rocked or pulled back and forth. Um, 
often provides the kind of stimulation that's necessary for a G-spot orgasm. Uh, G-spot orgasms are also uh, usually tied in with um, squirting, sometimes called female ejaculation, which doesn't happen necessarily every time, but if it does, totally normal. Um, it's not pee. Uh, squirt or, or female ejaculation is actually fluid that is being expelled um, from the urethra, but it is the fluid that is used to fill the urethral sponge. Let me get into a little bit of anatomy. When a person with a vagina is uh, aroused and their body is having the physiological response to arousal or just to imminent penetration that might happen, um, lots of blood is gonna rush to the area. Again, the clitoris, the vulva become um, like more filled with blood, more sensitive, um, often darker in color and enlarged. The vagina itself will uh, do something called tenting, where it actually grows and expands back a few inches in preparation for potential penetration. Um, some folks can actually feel this happening sometimes. Um, and then the, the urethra, so the tube that expels urine, has tissue around it called the urethral sponge. And that will fill with fluid to protect that sensitive urethra from any kind of trauma uh, due to penetration. So when someone has um, squirting, you know, from say G-spot uh, stimulation, that's that fluid being expelled through the urethra. Um, so a little bit of, of vaginal anatomy for you. Some people also uh, really like to have their cervix uh, pounded really hard. Some people hate that, uh, but that might be another avenue toward a more penetration-based orgasm. But the clitoris is very important. How do you deal with worries about being inexperienced? Do you only get good at sex through experience? You know, I think that, yes, <laughs> but also experience doesn't have to be with another person. Um, I think that we all learn through experience. We all learn about what we like and don't like through experience. And I think it's a lot of pressure and very unrealistic to expect that someone, anyone would be just automatically good at sex right out of the gate. And also good at sex or, uh, you know, experience can take a lot of different forms. At the end of the day, it's what works for you and what works for your partner or partners. Um, so I think self-exploration is super important. Um, it's hard to know what you want or communicate what you want if you don't know yourself. So I think our, our, one of our first and best sex partners can and should be ourselves. Um, but I don't think there's anything to be ashamed of if one is uh, less experienced either. Everyone um, goes at their own pace. Everyone finds themselves sexually at their own pace. Uh, when I'm in the shop, I have folks from you know 18 to 85 that come in, and sometimes folks are you know well past menopause, and they're saying you know well, I want to try this and I want to learn about this kind of orgasm, or I, me and my partner want to do this. You know, there's there's no wrong time. Um, to, to learn as we, as we age. So yeah, I would say as always be gentle with yourself, um, and, and use yourself as your, your, uh, your sex partner. I think that's a great way to learn. And two, when you are with another person, oftentimes both, uh, I call this enlightened self-interest, um, partners often also really want to please you. So knowing what you want and being able to direct them can make it hotter for both of you. So enlightened self-interest. How do you bring up sexual activity with a doctor for the first time? Oh, sure. Um, oftentimes doctors will ask you, but if they don't, and it's something that you want to talk about, um, I think you should just bring it up. Um, you know, I think that for all aspects of our health, when we talk to physicians, um, advocating for ourselves and finding doctors who will listen is important. And sometimes I know here, I had to shop around for a few years to find a doctor that I really liked, um, that I felt listened and had time. I think that can be tough in bigger cities because there are so many people they have to see um, and so many doctors around that sometimes you do have to shop around a little bit. If you've got a family doctor that you're comfortable with, that's awesome and that's a, that's a really great place to start. But um, I think it is important to bring these things up. And if it's a specific problem, also don't be afraid to see some kind of specialist. For example, if you're experiencing pelvic pain, there are, you know, pelvic health specialists um, that you can and should go to. You know, no one deserves to, to live in pain or discomfort. I will say it's tough. And I, I actually 
we do some work with the Tulane School of Medicine and the School of Public Health as well. Um, when they go to med school, doctors don't always get a ton of um, pleasure education. Like they definitely get, uh, you know, information about, you know, anatomy and, and um, epidemiology and, and the physical aspects, but there's not always a ton that they are taught in terms of pleasure. Um, I think it's getting better, but they got a lot to learn. So sometimes the, the sex aspect of what they are taught falls by the wayside. So often it is up to us to advocate for ourselves and just bring it up. But doctors have at, at that point kind of heard everything. They should not be shocked. Um, it is their job to, to help you figure out what you need and to keep you healthy. If you usually climax as a result of your imagination rather than like the sex that's going on and you feel guilty about that, should you be able to enjoy sex without imagination or toys? Like how do you deal with potentially a feeling of guilt? Again, I think uh, that's such a personal thing. I think a lot of folks use their imagination during sex and maybe more than you would think. Um, I don't think that there's necessarily anything wrong with that. Um, but it's certainly something that you could talk to a partner about. They may also be using their imagination a little bit too. Um, some folks need both that mental and physical stimulation at the same time, but also, you know, possibly incorporating the things that you do fantasize about into the play that you have with your partner, whether that's role play or certain outfits that you wear, um, certain things that you do. Uh, I think that can make it perhaps, uh, just more, um, encompassing for you uh, in a way that might be useful, um, guilt guilt aside. In terms of using toys, some folks just need toys to have an orgasm. Um, you know, there is a, a really famous toy called the Hitachi Magic Wand that is a white and blue back massager, basically. It's incredibly powerful as a vibrator. Again, it was designed to use on your shoulders and your back. Uh, but there have been sex therapists as early as the 1960s prescribing them uh, primarily to uh, folks with vaginas who had never had an orgasm as a way to just learn how uh, and as a way to um, be able to, to get off because sometimes folks need just direct, very strong stimulation. And if that's the way you're built, that's the way you're built. Um, I think finding ways to incorporate toys into your play can still be super sexy, again, because you can use them on each other. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you want a partner who wants you to be delighted and, and vice versa. So no shame in using toys in partner play. And we change over time too. Uh, different points uh, of your cycle, if you're a person who menstruates, uh, if you're on different medications, just as we age, you know, our, our uh, methods of arousal, the things that we might be turned on by can change. So we're never static either. How does someone know if they've had an orgasm? Do you have any tips for reaching orgasm during masturbation for someone who has a vagina? Sure. So the way that it, it can feel, um, and it's one of those things that's hard to, hard to describe other than perhaps uh, a subjective way. Um, but Again, it feels like, you know, a heightened sense of arousal often focused um, on, you know, on the clitoris, on the genitals. Um, a person as they near orgasm may find that their heart beats faster, their breathing becomes more rapid, um, they get more flushed, um, their muscles may really tense up, especially as they are having an orgasm. Um, you may feel very tense, followed by a release uh, and a relaxation. And then during orgasm, um, the pelvic floor muscles, the pubic coccygeus muscles um, will sort of beat. They'll, they'll contract and expand. Um, and this is something you can feel happen uh, when you have an orgasm. Um, and so these are some, some good classic tells. I would say definitely if you're a person who has never had one before, um, certainly use some of the, the techniques that I talked about in the beginning in terms of setting a scene, exploring your body, um, utilizing uh, erotica, porn, visuals, writing, uh, whatever the case may be, and possibly experimenting with stronger toys uh, if you really you know, just want to find out what it feels like. Um, so stronger wand style vibrators uh, can be surefire options. Again, a lot of these things are going to feel annoying if you're not already turned on. So if you have a sense of what it feels like to be aroused, 
that's a good place to start before you bring any kind of toys into it. Uh, using a vibrator, for example, on a uh, clitoris at rest, you know, outside of arousal can just feel kind of weird, uh, maybe annoying, maybe even painful. So don't necessarily bring toys in without already being turned on. Um, another solid kind of toy is the suction toy. These are a little bit newer. Um, the name brand originally was the womanizer, terrible name, great toy, but this actually creates a, um, air pressure and suction. Uh, that goes over the clitoris. And this is another type of toy that I find to be, if not foolproof, then pretty close. But again, it's important to be aroused first. Otherwise it can just feel weird. Can you recommend a lube that's better for sensitive skin? Does organic really mean anything? And what do you think about CBD lube? Sure. So in terms of lubes, there are four main types. So there is water-based, which the main ingredient is water. Sometimes there's also other botanical ingredients added in. Uh, there is silicone lube, which is purely inorganic silicone molecules. Uh, silicone lube tends to be a little pricier, but also lasts a lot longer. It doesn't dry up in the way that water-based lube might. Um, there is hybrid lube, which is a uh, water-based lube with a little bit of silicone, maybe 25% to keep it from drying up as fast, keep it to be a little more slippery and creamy. And there is oil-based lube. Uh, we do not sell any kind of oil-based lubes at Dynamo, nor do we necessarily recommend them. A, because oil will break condoms. So if you are using condoms, if you are using barriers, uh, dams, condoms, anything like that, uh, oil will break it. So do not attempt to use those together. Uh, oil can also uh, sometimes lead to um, irritation or, or um, uh, discomfort uh, if used vaginally. Some people can get away with coconut oil, but it's, again, it's one of those gray areas. Um, for folks with sensitive skin, I would say, look at the ingredients. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be organic. It just needs to have ingredients that are going to be compatible with you. A lot of drugstore lube um, has uh, glycerin as an ingredient, which is sugar. Uh, and that is not a thing you need to put inside um, a, a, a vagina or, or a butt. Um, the vagina has a very specific biome. It has lots of good bacteria in it that is supposed to be there that keeps you healthy, uh, keeps your pH to a certain level. And when you add glycerin or sugar to it, same reason you shouldn't like put, you know, whipped cream and chocolate syrup and stuff in there, like do not do it. Uh, that can really throw off uh, and lead to infections, um, yeast, bacteria, discomfort. So nothing with glycerin. Um, a lot of folks also want to avoid parabens. Uh, we see a lot of paraben-free like makeup and cosmetics too, again, because of possible cancer links. So read the ingredients on your lube, no glycerin, no paraben, no sugar. Um, for folks who are sensitive, I would say either a uh, water-based lube with very few ingredients. Um, so for example, Sliquid H2O uh, has like five ingredients maybe. Um, so not a ton that might be discomforting or cause an allergic reaction. Uh, silicone lube actually tends to be great for sensitive folks because it's very few ingredients. It's usually just two kinds of silicone. Um, and silicone molecules are too big to be absorbed into the skin. They'll just be flushed out on their own. So there's nothing that can like penetrate your pores. Uh, so most folks don't have any kind of silicone uh, irritation and silicone is condom safe as is water-based lube. And then hybrid is sometimes seen as a nice, happy medium. Uh, we sell the most hybrid lube at the store. Liquid Silk is the brand that we sell the most. Um, hybrid lube is great because it's good for both condoms and toys. Uh, silicone lube can uh, damage silicone toys. So for example, I wouldn't want to use silicone lube on this silicone toy because it can make the surface kind of sticky and weird. Um, but a hybrid or a water-based lube would be great. But I think mainly look in the ingredients. Um, if you're someone who has a lot of allergies or sensitivities, maybe going with something that has very few ingredients would be my recommendation. Do you have any hot takes surrounding grooming, especially pubic hair? Oh, I think it's really whatever works for you. So 
pubic hair, I don't know if I have any hot takes. Uh, pubic hair is one of those like really polarizing things. I know when I was younger, when I was in college, the like shaved completely look was very in. Um, I think that's less so now. I mean, it's still an option, but I think people are actually more comfortable with hair these days, which I think is really great. We grow hair as humans, but as humans, we also have the choice to cut our hair or grow our hair however we damn well please. So um, I definitely think that for a lot of folks, and again, I never want to be completely prescriptive, but if, for example, um, you know, you are about to, to have sex with another person, you know, being clean, uh, you know, having a shower, you know, or a, or a bath or just, you know, making sure that everything is fresh can be helpful and is much more important than um, whether you're freshly shaved or not. Um, I think you don't necessarily, if you do choose to shave, you don't necessarily have to wax. Um, you can use an electric razor, you can trim. Um, and I think this, this goes for all genders. You know, I don't think that there should be, oh, it's just folks with vaginas that have to groom, or it's just folks with penises that have to groom. It's really about finding your own unique style. And the great thing about hair is that it grows back. So if you don't like how it's grown out or it's been shaved off, you can wait a few weeks and it'll, it'll come back. But I think finding your own uh, style is more important than whatever the media tells us our, our bits have to look like. Do you have any tips for adjusting to slightly different anatomy during sex, specifically a longer clit to vagina distance that makes products like most rabbit vibrators not work? Sure. So that is a real thing. Uh, there's a book by an author called Mary Roach called Bunk. And uh, one of the things that I remember she explores, it's been a few years since I read it, was actually ease of orgasm for a vagina having folks um, depending on their distance from a clit to vaginal opening. Um, so I think that that is definitely something that uh, different folks have different experience with. Um, finding toys that are adjustable can be really helpful. Uh, you mentioned rabbit vibrators. I don't have one with me today, but at the shop, we have a really nice rabbit called the WeVibe Nova 2. And a rabbit vibrator, just FYI, is um, basically a vibrator that has both a penetrative end and a clitoral vibrator. So if this was used for penetration, you know, the person could get G-spot and clitoral stimulation at the same time. But everybody is built differently in terms of where their clitoris falls and their vaginal opening dies. So the one that we have at the shop, the Nova, actually the clitoral arm bends so that when you have uh, penetrated with uh, the long end of the toy, it's going to be against the person's clitoris no matter what. And the penetrative end also adjusts. So it is a pricier toy. Um, hopefully more adjustable toys like that will come on the market in body safe materials. Um, I think the Nova 2 is like 145. So it's an investment, but it is a good toy. Um, but yeah, finding toys that are more adjustable. Also, you can use for example, a cock ring and a dildo together. So if you wanted to make your own rabbit, you could have a dildo that you really like, put a vibrating cock ring on it and kind of DIY it, Frankenstein them together. And I love it when people get creative with toys in this way. And for our final question, where is Dynamo and how can we find more information about your shop? Sure. So Dynamo is located at 2001 St. Claude. It's the intersection of St. Claude and Toro. Um, so uh, like uh, Lucian said at the beginning, it's pretty close to Frenchman Street uh, if you're over in that part of the city. Um, we are a uh, blue building with green and yellow trim. We have a sign outside that's in the shape of a heart says Dynamo. And we actually had a big paper mache uh, vibrator, Hitachi Magic Wand, uh, which will be there for another few weeks. Um, we'll eventually take it down since Mardi Gras is over. If you want to know more about us, um, our website is dynamotoys.com. And then we're on Instagram as our main social media platform. We're at Dynamo Nola. Um, I try to do entertaining or educational uh, Insta stories almost every weekend. And the ones that I like the best or that I think are the most useful, I actually have saved in the highlights. So some of this information may actually even be in some of my highlights as I've done um, educational stories on the Instagram. Uh, so please follow that. Please come into the shop. Um, 
you do have to be 18 and up and I may ID you. <laughs> I'll, I'll probably will ID you. Uh, anyone that, that looks younger to me, I'm, I'm automatically going to ask for ID. So don't forget it. Um, legally, you do have to be uh, at least 18 to come in. So um, we're open currently Thursday through Sunday from one to six, and we're doing uh, next day local deliveries uh, every day, but Tuesday. So definitely check out the site and the Instagram to get all that information. You can sign up for our newsletter via our website, but please do give us a follow at Dynamo Nola and I will write it in the comments. But yeah, please come see me. I'm there. It's usually me that's there. So if you want to talk more about any of this stuff, um, it's almost always me right now. And thank you so much, Hope. That was amazing. Thank Such you. a great thank range you. of questions. Um, and we always yeah, the love questions were awesome. Hope here. Yes, I really appreciate yes, it. Y'all are so with it. Like every time I people ask me like, how was the event for Tulane? I'm like, these students are awesome. They know so much more than I did when I was in college. Like, it's really, really nice. <laughs> yeah, y'all kept us on our toes reading all the questions. No, um, they were great. Thank you all for coming. And remember to check out the Sex Week website um, for to see the rest of the events that are happening this week. And also, um, D uh, Hope from Dynamo will definitely be back even this semester. Um, I think that there might be like, two more events, um, maybe some sex ed quickies on the campus health Instagram. So stay tuned for that. And then Lucian, do you want to um, head off with a few last minute words? Yeah, I just once again wanted to thank everybody for coming out to this event. And, you know, just remember to check your emails to see if you won one of our gift cards from Dynamo. So with that, have a great night. Thanks, y'all.